So I work for rheumatology, um, which is an outpatient based service in the plant medicine division. And it, it's, and actually, I've been I've been working in the trust in this service in the various names for about a decade. Um, and Imparts predated me, so Imparts has been part of my um, working practice since I've worked at King's. So I um, I must confess I, I have a sort of from a conflicted perspective. I, I do research. I'm an academic as well as clinician, and have a long-held interest in the overlap between mental and physical health. Um, fairly on after starting at King's, um, I was fortunate to meet Matthew Hotoff, and um, and I, I think it needed very little persuasion that the routine recording of mental health symptoms in um, many long-term conditions is vital. In rheumatic diseases, our patients, by the nature of the disease, suffer with chronic pain, and um, it is perhaps unsurprising that um, there's a, a very significant burden of mental health comorbidity amongst our patients. And, and actually, in, in routine clinical context, it is very easy to forget to ask about it. Um, and so I, I think the imparts agenda, the, the, the strategy of trying to routinely collect the information and share it so it is usable in the clinic in real time is incredibly powerful. Yeah, so I mean, there are undoubtedly people across the ends across the spectrum and, and there are some people who refuse to fill in um, the questionnaires who, who don't want to engage with it and don't think it's relevant and there are others who see it as a really central part of the consultation that you know in in a short consultation that you have with a clinician there's a lot to cover this is an added value part of it I think for most of my patients though it is a welcome piece of the service and 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 I think there is a, a growing acceptance that the way we interact with patients is no longer just within the confines of the consult, but that we have things that are top and tail around the consultation um, with questionnaires, not just the questionnaires that are asking about mental health and in parts, but now we collect questionnaires about their musculoskeletal symptoms, um, about other aspects of their, their life and impact on the quality of life of their disease. And, and this has been something that has been recommended as part of our national and international guidelines in rheumatology that we should collect this sort of structured information from patients. Yeah, so, I mean, the for the majority of patients that we collect the information on, it, it adds value to the consultation. And, and it does that in, in many ways. For, for patients who are, are well from a mental health perspective, who don't have symptoms, it's incredibly reassuring that things are going well from that aspect. And, and for the patients who, um, who go, well, you often pick up aspects on the imparts. And I, I pick up one bit that is really valuable, which is imparts capture smoking information, which if you've known a patient for years, maybe the first time you meet them, well, I hope definitely the first time you meet them and they um, share their smoking history, you would provide smoking cessation advice and signpost them to the, the resources. Um, but if you've known someone for many years, those conversations reduce in frequency. But actually seeing it in imparts every time the imparts are recorded allows you to bring smoking back into the consultation um, and re reiterate advice and support sort of behavior change decisions. The, the other aspect, though, is, is the patients who who do share information through imparts about significant mental mental distress, be that serious anxiety or depression. And when you... Um, when you have that information available to it, it, it can actually become a center point for the consultation. For example, in a patient with rheumatoid arthritis who you are treating with um, targeted immunosuppression for their autoimmune disease, but they're not responding. And when you examine them, you find that they have widespread musculoskeletal pain, but clinically you're not sure there's definitely any objective inflammation or autoimmune disease active. One explanation for that is that actually their symptoms are due to concomitant fibromyalgia accompanied by comorbid depression. And, and imparts allows you to make that sort of diagnostic reasoning. It starts to change the way you approach. So rather than stopping a, a drug that may be controlling their autoimmune disease, you actually say that drug is doing what it needs to do. And instead we need to address the other aspects. And, and I, I was very struck by the, 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 the meta-analysis and systematic review that was done a, a few years ago um, that uh, Faith Matcham led on. Um, when she was here with with, with Matthew uh, and looking at and showing that 
the evidence base really for rheumatic diseases and particularly for rheumatoid arthritis is that having comorbid depression dramatically reduces the chance of treatment response. Um, and, and that you can't just say, well, if we treat the underlying rheumatic disease, the depression will get better. You need to treat both diseases in parallel. So I think there are, I mean, there are challenges about the logistics of getting patients to collect the information. And there is no doubt that the model of having an iPad in the waiting room is wonderful on, on so in principle, but the practicality of ensuring the iPads are charged, ensuring the iPads are given to the correct patients is logistically complex. Um, and we have seen, you know, data entry for patients taking part in imparts fluctuate enormously on a month by month basis, just depending on, for example, um, the, the clinic support staff who've been present. The move to um, to e-collection, to the e-imparts model has definitely improved. But again, it, it is about the, the reminders going out. And I think that logistics, the challenge of ensuring that the patients get the information in advance of their clinic and know what they're being asked to do is, is, is really, really important to, to consider. There, there is, I'm sure for, for colleagues, there is this concern that what happens if I find information about mental health comorbidity that I wasn't expecting and do I know how to manage it? I, and I think that maybe was an issue in, in years gone by. To me now, that's no longer a barrier. I, I think I feel much more comfortable um, reviewing mental health symptoms and discussing mental health comorbidity. And, and I think for, for rheumatologists, I think it's, you know, it's something we should fundamentally be happy to address. It's not that I would ever prescribe someone an antidepressant or recommend a particular, you know, talking therapy strategy, but rather I know where those resources can be accessed from. And, and we are fortunate at King's, and I think this is obviously through our links with with the, the sort of mental health services in, in the in the region that we have access to psychology um, relatively easy in the department, both through IAPT, but also through our a dedicated rheumatology psychology service. Yeah, so there's there's a, a, a very specific patient who comes to mind who, um, and this goes back probably about seven, six or seven years. And she is <clears throat> a patient who has had um, a form of arthritis since her childhood. And she's now in, in well into adult life. She when you meet her as one of the most buoyant characters she beams from ear to ear she is always delighted to see the clinic staff and um and when she arrives she sort of she lifts the room um she dresses very well and i would not have ever have thought she was someone who was suffering from from depression in the background she filled in in parts and this is years back and and I reviewed it in clinic with her and was really struck by the fact that she had a, a PHQ that was at the top of the scale, indicating a high probability of her having a significant comorbid depression. And when I then talked about it, it she opened up and was very tearful. And it, it struck me how the initial consultation that I would have had with her, asking her how her joints were, how she was tolerating her medication, talking to her about, um, for example, whether she would need to be referred to a surgeon for joint damage, I would never have captured the the aspects that she lived with. And she lived with, with a relative, with a, a family member who was slowly over time becoming a carer for her in a way that they'd you know, never anticipated. Um, and, and I think it's made, you know, I, I still look after and it's made the dynamic of the relationship much better. I feel better placed to to be able to manage her symptoms and help her um, as much as we ever do as, as doctors or, or healthcare professionals. Um, but I, it has also struck me that I would not have picked up on that, I think, because her normal outward character was so buoyant that I just, I wouldn't have ever expected it. And, and the fact, I think she was probably slightly more comfortable revealing that information in the, in the form on the computer and then was enormously relieved then when, when it was shared and I saw it. <clears throat> 